the old spiritual song we've just sung certainly serves as a good introduction to what I intend to speak about this morning. If you would please open your Bibles to the New Testament and to Matthew chapter 7. And we'll look at verses 13 and 14 in just a moment. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Whether people realize it or not, in this life in the flesh, they are on a spiritual journey. And whether they are religious or not, theirs is a spiritual path. Every day we live, we make choices that affect the direction in which we are going. Now, most religious people think that the paths that we can travel are many and varied. That all of them will eventually arrive at the same destination. I've never understood how just a casual reading of the scriptures can cause someone to think that way. In the Old Testament, as you look at all those things that typified matters under the New Testament, you look at anything you want there concerning God dealing with man and how man faithfully dealt with God, and it wasn't just any way that you pleased. <laughs> There are certainly many diverse religions and they are teaching that there are various trails and paths that lead to most of the time the same place. Some of them don't even have heaven in mind. But now what does the Bible say? The Bible makes it very clear they're only let me underscore the word only. Only two paths to travel in this life. And everybody that lives in this life are on one or the other of those paths. <coughs> I said last week in a sermon that everybody in this world is either a child of the devil or a child of God. Someone might have said, well, what about the innocent babies? Well, they, they don't need saving. They're safe, S-A-F-E. And so they would be on the side of God. If you're not accountable for sins, then, of course, you're not accountable for sins. But most people on this earth are either on the pathway to heaven, the straight and narrow way, which we'll note in a moment, or they're on the path that leads to torment. Eternally, Now to Matthew 7, 13 and 14. This is still in what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because... Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Well, I think probably most of us have been exposed to this verse many times, or these verses many times. And in this sermon, as we said, it's part of the Sermon on the Mount. Our Lord says there are two ways, and each with its own beginning, and each with its own end. One way is very heavily populated, and comparatively speaking, the other way is traveled by only a few. Now, the question I must needs ask myself every day of my life, and you need to ask yourself too. Where are you in your spiritual sojourn? Are we on the right way? Are we headed the right direction? Or are we on the wrong way? 
Now around here, it just seemed like about every month or every few months, somebody heads the wrong way on the interstate or on one of these roads around here and it never does turn out very well. It seems to me that if we see the importance of being on the right way on those things, when it comes to our eternal destiny, then we ought to see how important it is in that area also. Well, to answer the questions I've given, I want us then to look closely at what Jesus said. There are not three gates, there are not four gates, there are not five gates. Jesus said there are two gates. That's all. The wide gate represents the beginning to the way that leads to eternal destruction. To enter the gate is to begin the trip. It's described as wide for several reasons. It allows many to enter with no sacrifice on their part at all. They don't have to think about giving up anything pertaining to this life. It doesn't therefore require anything. One is uh, allowed to bring along whatever, shall we call it, baggage that they desire. Materialism, an unforgiving spirit, and the best way to sum it up, so I've already done it, believe anything you want to, God's going to accept you. That's the way chosen by most people. There are really no restrictions, no restrictions at all. It is also open, it's wide open. It's the path of least resistance. It's sad to say because you know where it ends, most people in this world who are accountable to God for their actions are on that path. But then he says there's another gate. He calls it a narrow gate. And again, it is a, the, being a gate, it represents a beginning. That is a starting point. And it's the beginning or the starting point to the path that leads to everlasting life. Question, why is it narrow? Well, there are reasons. It is a gate which requires self-denial and obedience to God no matter what the cost. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24. If we just got that across to people, you would go a long way toward getting a lot of people changed in their lives. Self-denial is not something that people like to do. And many times it's not very easy to do. And obedience means submitting your will to somebody else's and not doing as you please. So there's no room for a consuming desire for earthly goods and riches. These things the child of God, Matthew 6, 19 through 20, fully knows is just of this life and it's going to be gone. You certainly can't continue to possess an unforgiving spirit and everybody that ever did you wrong you hold a grudge against them Matthew chapter 6 verses 14 and 15 and in that same chapter verse 1 you see that a self righteousness is condemned and yet when you look round about you you see all of this kind of thing existence existing in many people. But now notice that the, these two gates are only the starting point. That's how you enter in. Let's look at, uh, and this zero in, on the fact that there are two ways. We've seen the wide gate enters one, narrow gate enters another. Well, the wide gate talks about a broad way. Why is that the case? Because it allows, and we are now repeating ourselves, it allows for any behavior 
one desires. I always think, and I've referred to it in several sermons lately, of Cain. Cain knew what God demanded of them to worship him acceptably. He did as he pleased. And he thought God should accept it because that's what he wanted to do. In this broad way, there's no need for reformation or the changing in one's lifestyle. God just says, come as you are, live as you please, everything's all right. Well, you can see why that is an enticing path. Many people, I guess we'd say most people, are on that path. You'll hear them talk about, well, we're free. Even sometimes saying God's grace that we can't merit and don't deserve is just poured out upon us. And since I can't really be very good at all anyway, then just a little bit of evil in my life doesn't hurt. And God's favor is going to cover it all. You never find that taught in the New Testament. These kind of people will think of themselves as being very open-minded. They think that receiving about anything that's taught is what ought to be. They view themselves as tolerant of others. Anything goes. I would simply say the best example you can get of that is to notice the people out of Hollywood or in even politics and things of that nature, and you don't ever say this is a must or that is something that you cannot do and be all right with God. Now, the next way is the constricted way. Translated narrow is the way in the King James Version. The New King James has difficult is the way, and that's the idea of narrow. It's difficult. Why is it difficult? Because this way is hemmed in on all sides by the commandments of God. And if you're not willing to do what's necessary in your life to submit to those commandments, you cannot just walk that way. You can't do it. So the picture is one of a narrow and difficult path. Actually picture it as between two cliffs and the will of God are those cliffs. The commandments of God are found therein. Here's a fellow that is so caught up in his drinking of alcohol, he's got such a big barrel of the stuff on his back, he tries to enter in, but he can't. It's too narrow. It's too difficult. Here's another one who has practiced a life of lying and cheating. Such a part of him, he's won't give it up here's another person who's full of all kind of foul language or he holds grudge against anybody that ever did anything to him there's no forgiveness about him he wants to enter in but he can't do it it's too narrow and so on you can go down the line you could say even sins of omission where there are people like Lazarus laid at the rich man's gate and people ignore them and go right on by don't think a thing about it. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. Thus, the way that leads to life is difficult. Why? Because it requires one a righteousness that exceeds that of many religious people, as Jesus taught it in his day, that exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, Matthew 5 and verse 20. It requires a rejection of your own desires, your own will, a change of mind, a change of behavior, Matthew 5, 21, all the way through chapter 7 in verse 12. And I'll pause here to say, if you look at our Lord's teaching in the Sermon on the Mount and other places, He is doing a great deal of His teaching on the way you think, your attitude, your perspective, your mindset. Well, why is that the case? Because Luke 8, 15 says, the good ground is the kind of ground that will receive the seed of the teaching of the Lord. And if you remain in that kind of unteachable mind to where you'll live like you want to do, then you're not going to become a Christian. 
And the Jews who had 1,500 years of living according to the law, Jesus came and they held their traditions up more than they did the actual teaching of the law of Moses. They had to be conditioned. That ought to tell us something when we go out to teach the gospel to every creature, that people's minds have to be changed to even receive with meekness the engrafted word. So because this weighs difficulty, then many choose to travel the other way. People will talk about the pure gospel and all its component parts, many of them being too confining. It's too restrictive. Do you really mean I must do this and do that? I've had people over the years when it came down to certain things they were doing to say, you mean I must give this up? You mean I must start doing this? The answer is yes. If the Bible authorizes it as part of what's needful for you to be pleasing to God, you absolutely must or you won't be pleasing to it. So they think it's too narrow-minded. And we're in the days of open-mindedness and tolerance nowadays. That's really the sign of a mature person. Well, I might remind you that a garbage can has a pretty wide open reception <laughs> door or can and you don't want to have that kind of thing so as Jesus describes the two gates and the two ways he also reminds us that there are two groups there are the many the many many there be which go in there at verse 13 and we have seen reasons why this is so the entrance is wide. Come as you are. No change is necessary. Just look at the churches round about you and see if that's not the case. The way is broad. You make up your own rules. There's Cain again. You believe what you want to. Just think about God when you believe it and he'll accept it. And you do what you want to. And this is the way people travel by default. I thought I'd use that word default, seeing that's on computers nowadays. And what does that mean on your computer? Well, it just does it on its own when it's set that way. And that's the way people like it. You have to actively and seriously seek the narrow path. So they want to take the nonchalant, easy road, and thus, the gate's not hard to enter in. Then there are the few. Remember, we're talking about two groups, the many we just talked about. Now the few. Jesus said, few there be that find it. Find what? The straight and narrow way. Matthew seven fourteen. People don't like to think in America where the majority rules that only a few can go to heaven. But that's what the Bible says. The Old Testament's full of material along that line. Two brothers, Cain and Abel. Abel does what God says the way he said it. Well, the reason he said it, he worshiped God, he's acceptable, Hebrews 11, 4. Then you come down to the great flood. Only eight souls out of all the millions that were there died. And if someone doesn't want to believe there are millions, all right. Several hundred thousand. <laughs> then after that, you have the children of Israel. They all leave across the Dead Sea that God opens for them. But yet in the wilderness, most died. Of those 20 years old and upward that left Egypt, only two, Joshua and Caleb, entered into the promised land. So you have the millions lost in the flood versus the eight saved on the ark, no one his family. You have the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Israelites who originally left Egypt, but only Joshua and Caleb of 20 years old and upward actually entered the promised land. What does that tell us? It tells us we're our own worst enemy. That's what it does because you can just about justify yourself and what you do and don't do in your own mind no matter how much you have to deceive yourself into not obeying God 
and thinking you're all right. On another occasion, Jesus had this to say in Luke 13, 23 and 24. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And here's the way he answered him. And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Now, when somebody says strive to do something, then that means I have to put my all into it. The word straight, I did not mention earlier in the King James Version, S-T-R-A-I-T. Then, you know, we have the English word S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T, which is like a straight line. But I did describe it to you that it's a difficult path, a straight path, hemmed in all sides by the authority of Christ, and one must submit to that authority to enter in and to stay on that path. And that's the point that's there. We have to give our all into learning the truth. You know, sometimes you say, well, why must it be that way? Look what God did for us. Seems to me just a, a, a casual reading of what the Lord did for us should cause us to want to give all that we are to the learning of his will and the doing of it all of our lives. That's the church in the true sense of the word church, the spiritual body of Christ, the kingdom of heaven, the family of God. Are we just near-do-well children? That this way must be found says we do employ ourselves in the finding of it and understanding how we find it. In Luke 13, 24, notice again, strive to enter in the straight gate. Many won't be able to enter in. I'll give you an example. The rich young ruler. Good Lord, what must I, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, they lived under the law of Moses. That's the way the Jews acceptably approached God. So he told him to keep commandments. He said, why, wow, these have I kept from my youth up. You know, inspiration, when it, record, when it records something, and records it infallibly. Well, it recorded infallibly what the young man said. But whether he had done so or not is another story. What like I yet? You know, that's something you, when we today ask that question, what like I yet, you better be prepared for the answer. Go and sell all you got and give it to the poor and come and follow me. Well, he wasn't expecting that and he was not prepared to do it. That was too straight. It was too narrow. Somebody said, well, I guess he expects us to sell all what we've got. No, that's not the point. If you get that, you miss the whole point. The point is nothing in this world can come between you and serving God. And since what we have and own, and if we've got a lot of money, then people don't want to give that up. They like it. So you see that it's not just an effort, but it's the right kind of effort. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek. That's a diligent search, a patient inquiry to find out what you know you need to know that's why the Lord taught so much on the disposition of mind and the state of one's thinking and finally we note that Jesus tells us there are two destinations there are only two everybody in this room you're headed one way or the other everybody all around you and your family extended family everybody in this county in this whole state in this whole nation in the whole world everybody headed toward one or the other destinations first one the wide path the wide gate broad path is to destruction broad is the way that leadeth to destruction it's easy to go down that just don't do anything 
Remember, most of the New Testament is written to Christians concerning being faithful. Paul wrote of the everlasting destruction that is to come upon those who are not prepared to meet their God at the end of the world. He said to the Thessalonians in the second epistle, chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall be punished? No rehabilitation here. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. There's no way that any of us can conceive of a state of being or place of being where God's influence is not there at all. Why? You did more serve me here. You didn't care about serving me. You did as you please. Even among religious people, I chose what you wanted to do and worship me no matter what my word said. You gave lip service to the Bible, but you didn't really comply with it. You didn't really care about pleasing me. Now, that's the way you lived your life, so you will spend your eternity. It is a place of no hope. Once you enter there, that's where you are. Tormented day and night, forever and ever, because you didn't love the Lord to keep his commandments. John described it as a lake of fire, Revelation 2015 in chapter 21, verse 8. If things like that will not cause a person to honestly view their lives and think, am I prepared to meet my God right now? And honestly answer that question. When Jesus says that many there be which go in thereat, and the destination is an eternal lake of fire, then what can change you? Only other thing left is the love of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God that he continues to give you time to obey the truth. And what are we doing with that time? We're letting it just slip slide away and not use it for what God intended. The other one leads to life, eternal life. Again, my mind can't grasp the glory and honor, power and majesty of eternal life in a place where there's no sin, no possibility of sin, where God's will is done to perfection. There's no devil, there's no temptation, there's no fighting a fight of faith. That's the reward, eternal life. And narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. We've already talked about what makes it narrow. This life is the everlasting life received on judgment day at the end of the world, Matthew 25, verse 46. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. It's the gift of God. Again, given at the end of the world, Romans 6, 22 and 23. These are the people who have been set free from sin. God does not hold their sins against them for They've been covered by the blood of Christ, no obedience to the gospel. They've come to have a vibrant faith in Christ built upon, thus saith the Lord, propositions. That Christ is the Son of God, the way, the truth, and the life. And that nobody comes to the Father but by Him. John 14, 6. These are they who have such faith in God that they see the commandment to repent, and they do what's necessary to repent and breaking down their old stubborn will and changing their way and reforming their life to set out on a course that's going to stick with that straight and narrow way by doing the will of God. And they're then going to obey the commandment to confess their faith in Christ that he's the son of God, Romans 10.10. 10. And then they're willing to be baptized for they're now qualified to do so in water by the authority of Christ, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, to obtain the remission and forgiveness of sins, 
Matthew 28, 18, verses following, Acts 2, verse 38. But see, now they've entered in. Now they live and they walk that straight and narrow way by being godly and being Christians. They're steadfast. They're immovable. They're always abounding in the work of the Lord. For they know their labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. We've been studying why walking this straight way is not a vain thing. They have willingly shackled themselves as slaves to the Lord because they don't want to turn loose of him. He's their hope. He's their, the captain of their salvation. He's the only mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. He's the one that will confess them before the Father. These are mine. Brethren, do you realize what a... A, a, a sense of relief that cannot be grasped now to be on the right hand of God and to have Jesus say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Or come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the world. Or think about those things because they'll help us stay on the straight and narrow way. We have become slaves then to Christ. And we want to stay there. He is the one that takes us to heaven. Not anybody else out there. His gospel is God's power to save us, Romans 1, 16. And thus we want to comply with it and be Christians. That's all. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. No sort of hyphenated Christian. Just a member of the church to which the Lord adds you to when you're baptized for the remission of sin. That's the church you read of on the pages of the New Testament. It's the Lord's church, purchased by the blood of Christ, Acts 20 and verse 28. These are those Christians, if you please. They're of Christ, such is the significant meaning of Christian. These are those who bore the fruit of holiness throughout their lives, Romans 6, 20 and 22. God, knowing their hearts, knew that they didn't want to sin. They lived the whole life not wanting to sin hating it when they did, confessing it because they repented, always keeping themselves on the straight and narrow way. That's to live the Christian life. Another sobering thought are these words about the way that leads to eternal life. We already touched on it. And few there be that find it. I've heard gospel preachers over the years and even read of them long before my time who would stand up and say, I'm preaching to you the way to heaven, the way that I'm on and others in this room are on, and if you're not on it, I want you to go with me. I want you to know the forgiveness of sins, that you've been added to the church, that you're a part of Christ, that you're enjoying all spiritual blessings in heavenly places because they're in Christ and you were baptized into Christ, Galatians 3, 27. There's no other doorway into Christ once you believe, repented of sins, and confessed your faith in the Christ, there's one door into Christ. Galatians 3.27, being baptized in the Christ. Thus, Peter would plainly say, baptism doth also now save us. Well, it does or it doesn't. I choose to believe the inspired word of God, 1 Peter 3.21. So we've seen that Jesus describes two gates, two ways, two groups, and two destinations so I ask you now in the light of the Bible not what men say but in the light of the Bible are there many roads that lead to heaven well yes I know many people like to think so are there many religions that lead to heaven I know a lot of folks like to think so Cain thought he was alright he knew what God said he even took time to build an altar and offer his sacrifices on it, but they were not according to the teaching of God, and it wasn't acceptable. It matters what you believe. It matters what you obey. Many people say it doesn't matter. Just be sincere in doing it, but the Bible doesn't teach anything like that. According to Jesus, that's what we ought to be saying. According to the Bible, specifically Jesus in his last will and testament, the New Testament. There are only two roads. 
That is two ways. One of them leads to eternal destruction, the other to life eternal. So I can only end this sermon by saying, um, which road are you on? Well, only you can answer that as a human being. By the way, God knows where you are. And God knows your attitude toward him, toward these two ways, and toward how to become a Christian. Well, we've studied that. As a child of God, if you need to repent because you sinned, you need to confess those sins, pray God for forgiveness. That's what he requires of one who is a child of God. And we've studied already what it takes to become a child of God. Folks, is that too narrow for you? It's just what the Bible teaches. I don't want to be any more narrow than what the Bible teaches. But neither do I want to lose people from what narrowness that it does teach. So if you're subject, as God searches your heart, to obey the gospel, we urge you to do while we stand and sing.